There's a really hilarious story I, I like to share about meeting with the CIA director for Bill Clinton out here at a dinner party some years ago, about 20 years ago. And um, of course, the interest was policy. Why the hell aren't we telling, why the hell isn't the president being told what's going on? Why are they lying to us? I'm the CIA director and I don't know nothing about this. And so we got through all that. And then we got into more of a relax. It was almost three hours we were together. My wife was with me. And um, the, the wife of the CIA director was the chief operating officer of the National Academy of Sciences um, over here. So she had a really scientific mind, whereas the CIA director was more policy, um, secrecy, policy, all that, and basically upset and mad because they had looked into the issue and knew they were being lied to, which is what, of course, all, the whole Clinton team knew that, and so did Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter famously said, I didn't, have a high I didn't have a high enough security clearance to be told about this, even though he had had a sighting as governor uh, of Georgia. But <laughs> so she basically said, well, I don't understand. How could they be communicating from one star system Let's say they're from a star system way out there, and they're trying to communicate with a craft that's here, one of these UFOs that's here. They, how could they possibly do that? Because the electromagnetic field is a, you know, the speed of light. You know, that's what your cell phone is, radios, 186,000 miles per second, speed of light. And I said, yes, I know, the speed of light is just too damn slow, isn't it? <laughs> I said, well, they're not. They're using a phased electromagnetic system that goes beyond the crossing point of light. And by the way, the chief scientists in Naval Research Lab said they have done experiments at NRL here that have done signals beyond the speed of light, but it is classified. He sat in my condo here and told me this word for word. Number three at the whole lab. He sits in on meetings with the vice president. I mean, I know this guy. This guy stayed at our home. This is real. So, but she didn't know about this because she was an administrator at the National Academy of Sciences. And I said, well, you know, my first thought was if I tell her the truth about this, she's going to think I'm a crank and a kook. And, you know, I'm a young doctor. I'm only 35 or I don't know, something. And I have four children I've got to put through college. I said, I'm going to ruin myself if I tell her the truth. And, uh, but I thought, well, you know, she asked me the question, and I owe her an honest answer. And uh, so I said, look, she, you've asked, but this, bear me out. I said, you know, let's take our Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. So this, if a beam of light went across at 100, 186,000 miles every second, it would take 100,000 years to reach the other side. That's just our galaxy. And in our galaxy is about 100 billion star systems, same number of star systems that there are neurons in our brain. Cool, huh? Interesting coincidence. And let's, so let's just say there's a civilization that is 1,000 year, light years from here. A light year is a distance, not time measurement, a distance measurement. It's the distance light goes at 186,000 miles a second in a year. So let's say it's 1,000 light years from here, which is 1% of the way across the Milky Way galaxy, which means it's in our neighborhood, because we're not even intergalactic now. Um, at the speed of light of your cell phone, a radio wave, a TV signal, a fiber optic, it's going to take 1,000 years for the signal to get from that home planet to their starship that's in our solar system, and another 1,000 years for the starship to say hi, got your message, how are you doing today, to go back. It's the time since the birth of Christ to so say hello and goodbye. <laughs> it's, not an, it's not a functional paradigm. So a priori, if you're interstellar, you are transdimensional. Then what does that mean? It means that your communication gear, as well as your transportation gear, is dropping out of linear space-time in a non-locality, a field of non-locality. Now, the ultimate field of non-locality is pure mind stuff, the essence of awareness. But that's absolute non-locality. 
but between the absolute field of non-local, pure, undifferentiated consciousness and 3D are a, a countless numbers of gradations of relative non-locality. And they may not be instant, but they're pretty damn fast, and they're certainly faster than the speed of light. Is this making sense to people? Okay, stay with me. So this means that they have electronic devices that are, when they're fully materialized 3D, have electronics that can pick up on directed thought and transmit directed thought. And I'll never forget Dr. Robert Woods, who is uh, one of our witnesses from uh, McDonnell Douglas, telling me a story, an old man McDonald. Um, I know this from two sources, Lawrence Rockefeller, who was very interested in all this, um, and who funded the original Project Starlight effort. If you, the AP had this whole release of Project Starlight documents from the Clinton Library. It was a big scandal a couple years ago. And we were putting all this stuff together, and Lawrence Rockefeller was involved, and his lawyer, uh, Henry Diamond, and all these big folks, and I was putting together all this stuff, but he funded the first uh, gathering of witnesses at uh, Silomar near Monterey in California in 1995. We had KGB people there and cosmonauts and astronauts and everybody. And what was interesting is that uh, this whole group of people kind of understood this area of thought and consciousness, but not too technically. And uh, what what we discovered was, was that through going back, this was I believe in the mid-60s, McDonnell Douglas was very interested in this. And old man McDonald himself was like, oh, I've got to know about this. So Dr. Woods, who is a very renowned aerospace guy, um, was sent to research all this stuff. Anti-gravity, UFO sightings, all this stuff. And he came back with this amazing case of a very high caliber case. Where I think it was in the Baja, California, where a craft had materialized, and this was back before we had systems to track them so well and hit them with electromagnetic weapons, which is what's happening today. We'll get to that. Um, and this little being came out, and it had a, like a little black box thing here. And it was obviously the communication device. And the people who had the encounter said that basically the ET was, it was communicating directly into their neural cortex and maybe auditory cortex with this thing in thought. And that when they would think back to the being, they wouldn't have to speak, he would understand it and receive it. And so it was a, if you will, a, a thought transponder instead of a radio transponder. And now, this sounds like science fiction, but it isn't. It's the only thing that can explain how you're going to scientifically and reliably be able to have a communication system that is from one star system or galaxy to another in real time. Again, spooky effect, two things at once, boom, boom. So you're, you're, you're dropping out of the linear barrier of space and it's basically space is obliterated, if you wish, to look at it that way, so that it, it's all right here. You can be a billion light years away and it's still right here because of the non-local effect of consciousness and understanding that other aspects of reality have a conscious component, including photons, electrons, and electromagnetic signals. There's a carrier wave of thought stuff consciousness stuff even within an electromagnetic signal. Get it? That's why the CE5 initiatives actually do work. Um, and when I explained some of this, finally the, the wife of the CI director said, oh, I thought it had to be something like that. <laughs> what was her response? I said, yeah, of course, you're a smart lady. I mean, it makes sense. Now, in polite company, polite scientific company, one's not allowed to talk about these things because it's, it's, it's a, a forbidden. This is I, or my book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, that the film series was based on. These are things you're just not allowed to talk about because it's so paradigm-busting scientifically and even theologically. 
because it begins to explain a lot of, quote, mystical experiences people have had that become a catechism or get misinterpreted through the millennia. But ultimately, if we want to seek the truth, let's find the truth and forget our dogma. I love that saying, my, you know, my, my karma ran over my dogma or something <laughs> like that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, you know, it, that's really, you know, the, the pure-hearted pursuit of the truth, no matter where it takes you, um, is really, really key when you're going into these uh, emerging sciences and, and areas of thought and consciousness. This then brings us to the numbers of people who have observed these kinds of phenomenon in the mainstream, where they will have an object, a sphere appear, and then inside the sphere floating into their house are these little beings in the sphere communicating in their thought. A very famous actor, who I've spent time with his, at his home in L.A., had this happen. Didn't think any of this was true. And then, of course, he, he found out who I was, bought all the books, and he said, oh, my God, that's why this happened, because he read the first book that I wrote, Extraterrestrial Contact, The Evidence and Implications. It came out in 99. Most people don't get to that book. It's really probably the most important one. Um, and what was fascinating is that he said, now I understand it. So he, he contacted me and I went to his home and um, we were sitting where this happened and then went out on his balcony which overlooked um, uh, Silver Lake Reservoir there in LA and um, oh, he's up in the hills and here comes this object, it comes straight down out of space, a yellow golden object, comes down, goes and goes in front of a cloud and then dematerializes. He goes, oh, did you see that? I go, yeah. I said, they know we're talking. I'm sure these are the same people who came into your house. <laughs> Wonderful, lovely. So uh, I think that a lot of people have had these experiences, but they don't have the understanding. My hope for, for this gathering today, but also the, the, the video that we'll put out, is that people will begin to connect these dots and make some sense of these experiences where uh, in the early days when I started looking into this, I found there were many, many accounts where people would see a craft, or maybe it's not fully materialized, maybe it's just a sphere, and they'll think something and it'll react to the thought. And people are, how is it doing that? It was reading my mind. Well, I mean, it's not Kreskin reading your mind. There is a science of, of what I call coherent thought receivers and transmissions that can take place between transdimensional interstellar capable civilizations and humans. Now we may not understand all the science and I can't say I can go to my a laboratory and build one of these things because I can't hook up my DVD player. Emily has to do that. I'm a useless for that kind of thing. You know, he's like, nurse, or Emily, help. You know, but um, the fibrillator's great and respirators and other stuff. For, no, computers, hurl them through the window. Um, I'm all thumbs, but you know it, it, we can understand it. So then, from an experiential point of view, from that paradigm, we can say, "Oh, I understand now how it is. Contact can be initiated, but also if it spontaneously begins to happen, how it begins to unfold, and why it can be both physical and in thought and electronic, uh, and then in these other." Phenomenon. I call it the epiphenomenon that happens. All the different manifestations of contact.